in 1936 when I was six, I got the flu. My Aunt Ruth brought me this miniature models kit for a Curtis F11C4 and I tried to build it. After I had the fuselage almost finished, my mother said I should spend more time outdoors, so she gave me a short lesson on tennis by bouncing a ball off the wall above my work table. I knew what was going to happen, and it did. She tried to rebuild the wreckage, but it had been too much for a six-year-old, and it was too much for her, too. A month later, my Uncle Wall, the skilled amateur craftsman, showed up with this very well-made model of the Winnie Mae, the Lockheed Vega that had disappeared off Point Barrow, Alaska, with Wiley Post and Will Rogers on board. The Winnie was a tad tail heavy, and it had a fragile prop, so this was its only flight, witnessed by Walt's daughter, my cousin Pat, my parents, and me. A month later, I bought some of this smelly stuff and started work on something that looked a bit like this a dime comet kit of a Viking Kitty Hawk biplane. When I finished it the first time, it looked like someone had put some sticks together and thrown red and yellow toilet paper at it. Flight was out of the question, but I had been exposed to the fumes from the comet glue, and 40 years later I was still building model airplanes. I don't use that kind of glue anymore, but the urge to build models lives on, and by my count I've now wasted countless hours building over 200 of them. This Kitty Hawk was built in 1984, and it can fly for 23 seconds. Not great, but not bad for indoors in a gym in Hawaii, the windiest state in the nation, and a place where outdoor areas are either covered with concrete, golf courses, or kiavi bushes. My next project was also a Comet model a 25 cent Ryan ST. It looked a little better, but it didn't fly either. The rebuild from 1978 does though, also for about 23 seconds. I tackled this dime Comet Aranka seaplane in 1942 and was disappointed when it wouldn't fly out of a spring mud puddle. I built the bigger Comet quarter version again in 1990 with a brown twin CO2, but that was too big for indoors. With this rebuild of the dime version with a GB24 twin, the problem is keeping it out of the rafters. In Needham, I also scratch built a Bell Air Bonita, the experimental shipboard version of the Air Cobra. That model flew fine, but of my three other P-39 projects, this big Gillow version was the only one to crack a minute. A smaller P-39 of the hollowed out blue foam fuselage from 1998 is squirrely in the manner of P-39s. This Curtis XP-55 Ascender, built in 1979 from stall plans, also qualifies as an oddball and also as a major pain until 2003 when it suddenly started flying like a bird. Georgie had to retrieve this one from a roof, but I thought it was gone forever.
I finished a Joe Ott Grumman Avenger on New Year's Eve 1942 that went nowhere, but this small Gillo version powered by a brown A23 CO2 does fairly well. Legendary stories went about during World War II that some people were actually able to get four-engine B-17 models to fly. I never saw one then, but I built a solid one in 1939 and scratch-built and flew another green one on a Whitline in 1942. This four-engine electric version built up from a monogram 148th plastic kit was finished on 5203 and flies okay if it doesn't blow too hard and the battery doesn't quit. Delusions of grandeur must have hit me in 1989 when I built up this stick and tissue Northrop XB35 from a 29 inch vacuform plastic kit. I had planned on central axis geared rubber power, but that turned out impossible, at least for me. Finally, in 2003, I reworked it with four microelectric motors, a high tech feather receiver, an ele electronic speed control, two CS10BB servos and a lithium polymer SYE601P battery from Skyborne Electronics. It's very squirrely in the trade winds, but I'm surprised it flies at all. By 1943, my father's work with the OSRD had taken us to Needham, Massachusetts, and here I built this Earl Stahl Ferry Barracuda without noticing that the beautifully drawn plan was supposed to be enlarged to the size of his Defiant. It didn't fly then, but the small rebuild from 1979 is one of my best flyers. This 9-inch Grumman F8F Bearcat was molded in polyurethane foam from a 148th plastic kit in 1997. So far, it steadfastly refuses to fly. So it was replaced by this 17-inch one from 2000, which does. In addition to the habit-forming glue, Comet put out some very good kits and products like this jigsaw and the famous nickel glider based on the Martin B-10 bomber. I started this Blackburn Shark in 1939 but didn't finish it reduced until 1999.
As a charter member of the Oddball Model Club, I was always fascinated by the Blom and Voss BV-141 that saw limited duty in Poland and Russia during World War II. This scratch-built rubber-powered model from 1982 refused to fly until I got it at the Brown A23. A dime Comet Chester Racer from 1938 did much the same until I rebuilt it also in 1980. About age seven, I built this Strombecker solid wood model of the Martin 130 China Clipper. It was a glamorous plane, and I also tried this laminated Comet model, as well as a stick and tissue version. But alas, four motors were out of the question until June of 2003, when I built this four micro-motored electric RC model with rudder and engine control only. A small SYE 601P lithium-ion battery from Skyborne Electronics barely keeps it in the air with a high-tech feather receiver handling the electronic speed control and the rudder servo. This little Satabria was built in March of 2004 and was the litter mate of the little Sterling Monaco. The Cleveland Model Company put out an impressive line of kits, including two gliders, the Eaglet a spin-off of the Bolus Baby Albatross. I could have bought a real one of those in 1965 for $500 at Torrey Pines. And this seven-foot Condor, probably inspired by a Grunau sailplane. Here my 10-year-old buddy Arnie Stillwell on the left looks on while my Aunt Helen's camera actually catches something of mine that flies. Note that the Condor is bigger than me. Helen took the pictures and she did a remarkably good job of keeping the thing in sight. At least she caught the crash. Although in retrospect, it when I was like eight and about five feet tall, I tackled this six-foot Comet Clipper designed by Carl Goldberg. It had an elliptical wing and a complicated ignition system. There were some good engines on the market, like this Olson 19, but I wound up with a Sky Chief that couldn't be started even by Leon Olson, the neighborhood model guru. He warned me to buy in the wing spar roots, but I didn't, so on the test glide, the wings weighed down by four D cells, the Sky Chief, a spark coil, a condenser, and a timer folded up in the middle. After I fixed it, Leon and my dad tried to get it flying, but it was too heavy for me to even launch. Revenge runs strong, so I built this thing three more times as an adult. Lost one of them at Bellows Field in 1976, another in Diamond Head Crater in 1980, and finally pitched this RC version off the hang glider launch at Makapu in 1995. I was in the process of building a one-third scale clipper with a Davis CO2 engine in 1995 when I asked myself why. Not only is there no reason why an eight-year-old kid could build this thing right, there's no reason why anyone could. Those elliptical undercambered wings with four tapered spars and the ribless but symmetrical tail surfaces may look good on a Spitfire, but there's no reason why a contest model should be this difficult.
God, you scared me. The wing is flying away. Where's the wing? The wing's over the other side. Okay. You didn't warn me. Well, I, it wasn't entirely intentional. <laughs> <laughs> I was planning to bag it, but <laughs> not right then. This Corbin Ace was scratch built from factory plans in 1967 when I moved to LA after my internship at San Diego County and encountered the Flight Masters Model Club. It took third in their indoor nats with a 45 second flight that year. Earl Stahl's Bolton Paul Defiant plans and a 1940 air trails got me hooked on Stahl's beautiful plans and this extravagantly impractical British turret fighter that had no forward firing guns. Because I didn't understand about propellers and rubber, this didn't fly until I built another in 1979. It stayed up for a minute at the 1998 Flying Aces meet in Geneseo, but it was too big and too fragile to bring back. I gave it to a modeler from Wisconsin and built this smaller one when I got home. In 1940, I built an all-black Douglas TBD identification model in my grade school shop class. The 1983 flying model is a tough subject though because of the short nose. Another oddball is this Dornier 235 push-pull fighter that I first built up from a 148th plastic kit in 1978. It flew poorly, but was replaced in 1982 by this bigger version from Don Srull. I built this Fokker DR1 triplane frame from factory plans, but the finished model failed to fly with rubber power in 1968. I tried again in 1978 with a Davis 020 powered Gillow that left it in Geneseo because of its fragility. Finally, this 124th scale kit from 2001 flies well with a brown A23 CO2 engine. It features a rotating dummy Gnome Rome. The <laughs> Williams Brothers Grumman Duck was really too small to think about, but I molded the polyurethane fuselage from the kit. It looks nice, but there isn't enough room for a prop because of the protruding hull. Another famous Navy biplane was his Grumman F3F, also polyurethane molded from a 132nd plastic kit in 1999 and powered with an A23.
A famous Navy biplane fighter from the 30s was his Boeing F-4B-4, said to be so maneuverable that the pilot's hand out of the cockpit could turn the plane. I built up this polyurethane version from a 132nd Asagawa kit in 1987. It flies stably with a brown A-23. I built my first Grumman F-4F in 1939 from a Whitman kit. This Earl Stahl version was a modest success in 1940, but this scratch-built version from 1980 with vacuform parts from a 132nd Ravel kit and powered by a brown A-23 is the best flyer. It also won a beauty contest at an Alamoana craft show. In 1943, I found out from a Joe Ott Corsair that it makes a good flying model. I built the big Gillow kit in 1976, and it flew, but the best of the lot is this little scratch-built rubber-powered F4U from a Revell 132nd kit in 1998. This Mitsubishi Float Zero started off in 1976 as a small gillow kit, but in 1985 was built again from a Ravel plastic kit. It too uses a brown A23. This Fox Wolf 190 or TA-152, depending on your perspective, was built in late February of 2004. Comet put out a dime kit of the Fokker D7 and in 1938, mine flew all the way across the street from the top of Rice's Hill to Wilcox's front yard. This 1986 rebuild of the Telco CO2 engine flies better than this when it's not fighting the trade winds. Around 1938, the Pure Oil Company of St. Paul stole Texaco's Thunder with the large metal model of the Northrop Gamma, a high-altitude research plane. My father bought it for me at a gas station, and it had an electric motor and a prop that could barely move it on the floor. It took some figuring to get the Pure logo right when I built this flying version in 1988.
king of my oddballs is this GB Super Sportster built from Miguel plans in 1979. Like the Bumblebee it has no right to fly but this one does so with the Telco engine. GV is in the center. GV is in the center. It's looking pretty good right now. GV is in the middle. GV is in the middle and now it's pulling up into its hijink. GV coming. Hey, not too bad for the GV. Meanwhile, that Curtis F11C4 Goshawk that had started things off kept bugging me. I built the Cleveland kit in 1941 and while it looked good, it couldn't fly. In 1979, I built this 11 inch Goshawk using parts from a plastic kit and power from a brown A23 CO2 engine. This is a stick and tissue rubber powered model of the Hamburg 137, a prototype attack plane built by the Germans in 1937. The plans were in the Flying Aces Club newsletter. I built the small Gillo F6F in 1974 and destroyed it totally with the Cox 01 gas motor. Built this one in 1976, then a big F6F in 1979 that wiped out with a Cox 049. Finally put a brown A23 CO2 in the Survivor and it puts in satisfactory flight. The Comet made a quarter kit of the Hawker Hurricane and in 1940 I entered a sticky silver painted version and won a ticket to Flight Commander starring Walter Pidgeon and Robert Taylor. The plane didn't fly, but a stall version from 1944 and this modified Gillow kit from 1976 both did. Over the years, I had mediocre results with endurance models. The Claude Hopper in 1941 put in a 45 second flight. The Cleveland Flying Dutchman just sat there and glared at me, as did the Lonzo Stick in 1939. The Miguel Primary Glider, the Berkeley Sinbad, and Miguel Sailplane were a kick. The Jasco Thermic was a downer and I lusted after, but did not build this 8-foot Comet Sailplane gas model. Cortez Wakefield in 1943 wouldn't fly, but a rebuild in 1977 caught a thermal, flew out of Diamond Head Crater, and disappeared over Kapahulu. The Comet Sparky was a mess. My own designed flying wing glider in 1942 and a rubber powered flying wing fighter in 44 were modest successes. I designed a blue and yellow Wakefield type covered with monocoat and flew it at Geneseo in 1998, but I left it there. Finally, there was this Jabberwock which wouldn't fly in St. Cloud in 1943, but in reduced form in 1995 produces retrieval problems like this. The stick and tissue plans for this rubber powered Chance Vought OS2U1 Kingfisher turned up in the Flying Aces newsletter and I finished it in June 2003. Here's another WW Deuce High Winger, a Westland Lysander, built up in 2002 from a Matchbox 132nd kit. The high aspect ratio and the heavy wheel pants make for a tricky flyer. An early one from a 148th kit departed this world from the Makapu'u launch box in 1977. 
and I regret it now because a brown GB12 might have coaxed it to actually fly. Earl Stahl turned out the best of the magazine plans and I built most of his fighters simply because they're such a challenge to fly. But this Comet Quarter Messerschmitt from 1999 was the best of four built since 1944. A big Migau monocoupe that frustrated me when I tried to build it at age 8 was replaced in 1999 with a small Sterling version. Comet put out a dime model of the Howard Mr. Mulligan 1930s race plane. I jumped out of a real one of these on my first parachute jump at Elsinore in 1968, so I decided to build the model in 1988. It flew nicely with a brown GB12 CO2 engine and nicely when I converted it back to rubber. Of my five Mustangs dating from 1943, this modified small Gillow version of 1998 flies the best. In 1989, I figured out how to make scale flying models from plastic display kits by making a plaster of Paris mold, saturating it with mold soap, and then squirting polyurethane foam into it. The Curtis P6E was the classic Army biplane fighter from the mid-30s. Cleveland put out a classy kit and Comet had both dime and 50 cent kits, but I built this little 9 inch one in 2000 from a 148th monogram plastic kit using the polyurethane foam technique for the fuselage and vacuforming the wheel pants. That didn't fly too well, so I blew up the 50 cent Comet plants at 18 inches and did a stick and tissue P6E later that year. This all molded polyurethane P47 Razorback from 1986 looked great new, but it wouldn't fly either until I put stick and tissue flying surfaces on it. And ditto for this 1985 P47 bubble top. Both P-47s need brown B-100 CO2s to get in the air at all. This P-47 molded from a 148th monogram kit in 1997 is no great shakes either.
Comet sold a dime kit of the Boeing P-26 P-Shooter. In 1938, I spiraled blue junk tissue as covering for its round fuselage. This P-Shooter would fly better if it was bigger than 10 inches, but it came from a 132nd Revell kit and has only a brown A23 CO2 motor. The Lockheed P-38 has always been a fascination with its twin counter-rotating propellers. This sheet foam model built from Comet plans more or less flew at Flight Masters contest at Sepulveda Basin in 1968, but not as well as the Big Gillow version which demolished itself against a Manoa Park palm tree in 1978. This 2001 build-up from a 132nd Revell kit, however, has been the most consistent of the bunch. From 1939 to 1978, I built four Curtis P-40s, but the best of the lot seems to have been the small yellow version. This Northrop P-61 Black Widow was built up in 1983 from a 148th monogram plastic kit using stick and tissue and vacuform parts from the kit. Captain Arthur Page, USMC, had lapped the field of the 1930 Thompson Trophy race in Chicago when his modified Curtis Hawk crashed, killing him. Yeah. I built this Cleveland replica in 1976 and it flies okay with its Telco CO2 motor, but it's too big indoors and too small in the trade winds. In the summer of 1941, I got a projector and traced out a plan for a three-foot PBY. I built another small one from the Joe Ott kit when our family moved to St. Cloud, Minnesota, but while both could glide, they couldn't fly without engines and were last seen rotting away in the Wilcox family attic. In November 2002, I built this smaller version of the first one, decked it out in a pre-war neutrality color scheme, and got it flying as an electric RC. As you can see, it has a big tail and lots of dihedral because that's the only way I can get anything to fly in these bouncy trade winds. This Mitsubishi F1M2 Pete, since I'm a sucker for float planes, it was done in July 2003. When I was three, my 36-year-old maternal uncle Chuck Otto was killed when the Otto Gyro he was piloting crashed into Lake Michigan. Not ever meeting him has been a deep regret. Chuck was an all-around athlete from Philadelphia and a barnstormer. When he tired of selling rides in his biplane, he began flying a Pitcairn PCA-2 as advertising for the Lee Tire Company of Conshohocken, Pennsylvania. He participated in the opening of Bendix Airport in South Bend, Indiana, where he met the famed parachutist Spud Manning, 24, and agreed to fly Spud and his friend Magenta Gerard, 22, to Curtis Reynolds Airport in Glenview, Chicago in time for Spud's performance in National Airmail Day at Grant Park. The plane was seen circling over the Michigan City Airport on Wednesday, September 7, 1933, as if to land, but then departed toward Chicago and was shortly after observed to tail slide into Lake Michigan. But the three bodies washed up at the foot of Aldous Street in Indiana Harbor three days later, stripped of their underwear, apparently in an attempt to swim ashore. My model of the Pitcairn is patterned on the Williams Brothers Bill Hannon plastic kit 
and is powered by a tiny and very cranky brown GB12 CO2 engine. The real plane is shown here in clips for a movie. Having no previous auto gyro experience, I could get it to fly only 8 seconds. Spud Manning was the first to demonstrate stable freefall, and as of 2003, his children and grandchildren were still active skydivers. In 1939, the Poles took on Messerschmitt 109s with things that looked a lot like this stick and tissue PZL that I built in 1986. On a trip to Yellow Lake in 1938, this peerless Rearwind Speedster surprised me by almost flying. That one didn't look much like this one, although it was orange. In 1942, I built two Dauntless SBDs, one from scratch that flew, and a heavy Cleveland kit that didn't. A big Gillow in 1978 flew, but it was too big for the gym. A tiny scratch 1997 polyurethane 148 version was too tiny to fly, but this scratch built one with printed tissue from 62301 does fairly well. Scientific Model Airplane Company put out this nice little ROG rise off ground, but I couldn't get it to fly either in 1938. This rebuild from 1999 does much better. In 1939, I had high hopes of flying this Migau Curtis Seagull off the water at Lake Minnetonka, but it too refused to cooperate. This rebuild from 1992 did much better, but in the meantime, I had built two other Earl Stahl versions of it in 1942 and again in 1982. My Comet Seversky P-35 in 1938 failed to fly. The Williams Brothers 132nd Seversky kit furnished the molds for this vacuform model in 1980, and it only flies on alternative leap years. The Douglas Sky Shark was a 1950 project for a fast attack plane with counter-rotating propellers and two Allison turboprop engines. Two were built and one killed its pilot because of gearbox problems. I scratch built this model in 1987 but had to fiddle for years with the counter-rotating props that only worked because of three Lego gears and the proximal spinner.
Lindbergh's Ryan M1, The Spirit of St. Louis, made a good scratch-built scale subject in 1988. I buried the A23 cylinder in the dummy engine. This dime Comet Spad was a disaster in 1940, but a reduced version with a brown GB12 CO2 engine 40 years later can barely stay in the gym. This stall Spitfire was a headache in 1944. It didn't get better with a big Gillo version in 1974 and barely better with this 124th polyurethane CO2 model from 1998. Yeah. I wasn't very satisfied with that Spitfire, so in March of 2004, I built a small Gillow yeah. Spitfire, which features camouflage printed on with an Epson C82. The Stinson Reliant SR7 has a large wing and attractive lines. This Comet quarter version was one of the first models I built when I arrived in Hawaii in 1970. The large Sterling Stinson kit in 1978 had a beautifully vacuformed cowl with rocker arm bumps all around. But while the model put in a one minute flight with a Telco CO2 motor, it was really too big. I tried to get around the cowl bump problem with the 10 inch model build up from this AMT 148's kit in 2001, but it was too small to fly. Finally, I built my own cowling with proper bumps in 2002, and this model flies well indoors. Little did I know that Hawaii, with its trade winds and absence of grassy fields, would turn out to be the worst place on earth to fly small scale models. This Fiesler Storch German utility plane from a lightened up Gillow kit in 1983 is a natural, however. Its predecessor in 1964 didn't fly, but that was because I used the redwood tree that came with the box. Dive bombers are good scale subjects because of the large wing area. Amiga Stuka from 1943 flew well. The big Gillow version I lost in Diamond Head Crater in 1977. And this little Gillow kit from 1983 is also pretty good. In 1987, I built a 12 by 17 inch vacuformer Intending to use the 2 mil styrene sheets peel from Artcore graphic board as both structure and covering material. This bubble top P47 from a Monogram 148th kit, an F16, and this Kawasaki KI61 Tony from a 132nd Hasegawa kit are examples. Only the Tony has shown any inclination to fly, however. The short nose moment of this Hawker Typhoon, polyurethane molded in 1986 from a Hasegawa 132nd kit, makes it a poor flyer whether it's rubber or CO2 powered. The scientific model's Flying Yankee endurance model 
was a good flyer in St. Cloud in 1943, and even better when I built it again in 2000. It's a good thing it's yellow. After tangling with the Comet Clipper, this Comet Mercury in 1941 was a snap, but once again there was engine trouble in the form of a Madewell, so it never got off the ground. A rebuild in 1977 with a Cox 049 flew out of Diamond Head Crater and disappeared over Kaima Key. I also built a full-size zipper in 1950, the prize from a display model contest that I won with a Globe Swift, but it too had engine trouble. Finally, I built the scaled-down zipper in 1978, and it stays in sight only because it has a broken-down Telco CO2 engine that barely runs. The B-36 was the Strategic Air Command's Peacemaker Bomber. Now there's an oxymoron, but it has the dimensions of an endurance rubber model, so I picked up the Monogram 172nd kit in 1989 and stick and tissued it to a 39-inch span central axis rubber model with power geared out to all six pusher props using gears that I molded myself from two-ton epoxy. I took this model back to the Flying Aces meet in Geneseo twice, the last time in 1998, but the wind and the rules got in the way. The model couldn't crack the 22nd minimum flight requirements. So, in October 2002, I put a two-axis radio control in the beast, and Georgie and I pitched it off the launch box at Makapu'u. It flew, to my surprise, like a Manaweeva bird. After that, it was a matter of professional pride or simple insanity to build another one that would fly on its own. In October 2002, I finished a scaled-down 63-gram, 27-inch span stick and tissue B-36 with the same central axis rubber power, but using molded nylon bevel gears attached to their 132nd inch wire axles with thread and cyanoacrylate glue. This one consistently flies for 26 seconds. So you wind the B36. The, the axle of the crown gear goes past the wing, and there's a little loop, wire loop. You stick this through the wire loop, comes out the other side, that secures the loop so that you can wind it. You then put the peg through the stooge, pull out the rubber, and you usually put about 40 turns into the rubber. This one's, this rubber's broken, so I'm only going to put in 10. 10 times 16, that's about right. You then attach, let the little hook snap into its two holes in the nose. And the model's now ready to launch. Okay, here's what, what, here's what happens when you pull this out. All six motors running off one central rubber band.
As for that Winnie Mae that got me started, in 1977 I rebuilt the same 36 inch Comet model my uncle Walt made back in 1936. It flew for a minute at Geneseo and placed, but I left it with my sister and brother-in-law, Ann and Howie Ford and Scanny Atlas, because it was just too big to keep. In 1999, I scaled down the Comet plans to 14 inches, printed Wiley Post's full itinerary as he had it when Point Barrow swallowed it, and got it to fly reasonably well even I think this does it for me on model airplanes. I'm 73 years old now and I would like to get back to the things that I really enjoy, namely skydiving, hang gliding, acrobatic trampoline, and most importantly, the study of physics, which I left when I went into medical school.